This is a single player game where you can control infinite players. How does it work and why did I make this? It all started with the GMTK Game Jam, a four day game making competition hosted by Game Makers Toolkit. My only goal was to get into the top 100 to get a shot at being in their recap video posted at the end of the jam because they're the channel that inspired me to start game development in the first place. So if I could get into their video, that would be pretty cool. This year, the theme for the jam was loop. And after a couple hours of brainstorming ideas, I came up with the perfect one circles. Now, I couldn't really figure out how to turn that idea into a game, so I decided to go with my second best idea. Basically, the game will record what you do, and then you can create a clone of yourself to repeat all of your actions, and you could technically have an infinite amount of clones running around doing things for you, which is pretty cool. The only problem with this idea was that I had no idea how to make it. To be honest, I wasn't even sure if it was going to be possible, but luckily, I managed to find a video that pretty much explains exactly what I need to know. The way it works is that every 0.0333 three, 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 four seconds, the player records its position, rotation, and any other data the clone needs. And then once the clone spawns, it just iterates through all of that data and can update its position, rotation, and everything else that was recorded. And that's pretty much it, which surprisingly only took me like 30 minutes of programming to do. And even more surprisingly, it works perfectly. You've probably noticed that I created a really high quality model for this clone, but I decided to take some time and make something a little bit better. I'm not really sure why I decided to make him a bald prisoner, but I just thought I would figure that out later. Next, I needed to add some animations because at the moment, the clone is looking a little bit stiff. You see this guy? He wasn't subscribed to Rai Game Dev. So you better subscribe right now, unless you want to end up like him. <clears throat> Uh, what was I saying again? Oh yeah, I need to make some animations. And as a professional animator who took a 3D animation class in university, it shouldn't be a problem to go to Mixamo and steal all their animations. Look, I was on a time limit, okay? And my masterpieces, they take time. But now that I could create as many animated clones as I want, all I had to do was actually make a game and get in the top 100, which doesn't sound too hard, except I have tried this two other times and it didn't go very well. But this year I had a lot more experience and I was pretty confident. All I had to do was just make a good game. And I decided that I was going to make a puzzle game. The only problem was that I had never made a puzzle game before, but I mean, how hard could it be, right? So I started working on a level and added a very high quality door and a very high quality button that controls that door, which is blocking the exit. But the problem is that if you get off the button, you won't actually have enough time to get through the door. So how do you do it? The solution is that you get your clone to stand on the button for you. I know it's pretty complicated for a first level, but I wanted to make something a little bit challenging. And then to beat the level, you just need to throw yourself into this tube, which I think it's pretty easy. All you need to do is aim a little bit and land in the tube, so it shouldn't really cause any problems. Now, I do have to share some bad news with you. When I was trying to turn this clone system into a puzzle game, you probably noticed that I added a timer, but I also decided to limit the amount of clones you can make, which means that you can't create an infinite amount of them anymore. I tried to make it work, but I don't know how you make a functional puzzle game with infinite clones. So I had to make the sacrifice to give myself the best chance of getting in the top 100. And at this point, I was pretty happy with the level and I decided to go to sleep since I had pretty much worked 14 hours straight. But once I woke up the next day, I realized that this level looks horrible. I said this was a high quality button, but come on, it's decent quality at best. So I took some time to do some planning and started making some actual art for the level. And I know what you're thinking. This looks kind of similar to Portal 2, but what? You think I would intentionally steal the design of another game? That's crazy. And now this level was pretty much complete, which means that I needed to start making some new levels. But I'm going to be honest, this puzzle was really the best I could do. And that's why I decided to do some research. And it turns out that the host of the jam, Game Maker's Toolkit, actually has a video on how how to design a puzzle. So I watched the entire thing to try and understand what makes a good puzzle. I also decided to play Portal 2, but not because I wanted to steal their puzzles or anything. I recognized this. I definitely didn't steal this puzzle design. I just, I, you know, me and Valve, we just, we think the same. I mean, even if I did want to, I didn't really get that far into the game and might have gotten a little bit distracted. Damn, look at that high quality toilet. And look at that, what's that? A circle? I knew I was on the right track. <gasps> Circle. And after conducting my research of watching the GMTK video, I learned that there are five steps to making a good puzzle. Deprive, manipulate, sabotage, subvert, and conceal. Now, technically, the GMTK video didn't mention these points by name, but it was pretty heavily implied. But the most important thing I learned from this video is that the objective of the game needs to be easy. Since the challenge of a puzzle game should be figuring out how to solve it, not actually trying to solve it. So it's a good thing that the tube is really easy and perfectly fits this requirement. So with those five steps, I started designing and making levels for the game, which was going pretty good until I realized that there's not really that many interesting levels I can make with just a button and a door, which is why I decided to create some new mechanics. And the first thing I came up with was blowing up your clone.
Until I added this, there wasn't actually a way for the player to get rid of their clone, and this was just the first solution that came to mind. For the next mechanic, I wanted to make sure it would be unique, so I made an anti-clone field which will also blow up your clone, but it can get turned on and off, and the player can walk through it without blowing up, which, in my opinion, makes it pretty different. And the next thing I made was a laser, which, again, blows up your clone, but it'll also blow you up if you touch it, which technically makes it unique, but I'm gonna be honest, after coming up with the laser, I pretty much ran out of unique ideas. So the last mechanic I made was a button. I know that I do already have a button, but after coming up with three completely different and unique ideas, I just decided to make something easy. But you might be looking at these really unique mechanics and thinking to yourself, I wish I could do that, but I don't know where to start. Well, when I was first learning how to make games, I used a game engine called Game Maker. This video is sponsored by Game Maker. If you don't know what Game Maker is, it's a game engine that's been used to develop some of the most successful indie games, including Undertale, Hyperlay Drifter, and more recently, Deltarune and The King is Watching. When I first started making games, I chose to use Game Maker because I felt like it was the most beginner-friendly option, and it was really easy to pick up and quickly start developing games. Back then, I wasn't the highly respected, award-winning professional game developer that I am today, so I just used Game Maker to make small games as a hobby in my free time. And if you're thinking about trying to make your first game, I think the Game Maker is a really great option and can quickly take you from knowing nothing to developing your first game in no time. You can even fully develop games without writing a single line of code with their visual scripting tools. And it's not just for beginners. Lots of people have released full commercial games using the engine. So whether you're looking to make games as a hobby or are planning on developing and releasing a commercial game, Game Maker is a really great option. They've got a really supportive community with an active forum and discord if you ever need to ask for help. And if you don't know where to start, Game Maker has a short tutorial series on how to make an RPG game using the engine that'll teach you all of the basics you need to know to start developing games with Game Maker. So go click the first link in the description to download Game Maker and start making games fast today. And after making all those mechanics, I ended up with nine total levels, which I think are all pretty good, thanks to the five steps of puzzle design that I learned from Game Maker's toolkit. But just to make sure, I asked one of my friends to play it and give me their thoughts. But uh, they got a little distracted. So I also asked my loyal patrons to try the game and I got some good feedback. Apparently they found the objective of ragdolling into the tube a little bit difficult. So even though I thought the objective was pretty easy, I decided to make the two bigger to fix the problem. If you also want to play my games early, make sure to go check out my very affordable Patreon. And right now it's 55% off. So you better go sign up unless you want to end up like him. Anyway, the feedback I got on the level design was actually pretty good. So I think all of the levels are at a decent spot, except they look terrible. Each level is basically just an empty white room. And if I wanted to get into the top 100, I needed this game to look like GTA 6 on steroids. But the problem with that is I only had about five five hours to finish this game, and GTA 6 has been in development for like a decade, so I wasn't feeling too confident. The first thing I decided to do to make the levels look nicer was to add a starting room, and I also made some props to fill it out, except I wasn't too sure what props to add, so I just ended up making a few simple things, like a metal crate and some vents. But then, I thought back to my research playing Portal 2, and remembered the one thing that really stood out to me while playing, the thing that really makes Portal 2 a masterpiece in the world of gaming, the toilet. So I made one, made it look really dirty, and now the level definitely looks better. And because of the toilet, I decided to make the starting and ending room trash rooms. So I guess the lore of the game is that you're a bald prisoner escaping a facility down a trash chute. There just also happens to be a bunch of puzzles in between each one, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So uh, just don't think about it. Now, the next thing I can do to make these levels look even better is to add some actual lighting. I do technically have lighting already, but it's just this one real-time directional light. And since it's real time, I can't really make realistic lighting because that would probably blow up my computer and burn my house down. So you might be wondering, how do you get realistic lighting without blowing up your computer? And the answer is baked lights. A baked light is just like a regular light, except you bake it, which doesn't actually have anything to do with baking. It just means that you pre-calculate all of the lighting instead of doing it every single frame, which means that you can have way more realistic lighting and way better performance. And using baked lights makes my levels look dramatically better and without burning my house down. And the last thing I did to make the levels look better was add some graffiti onto the walls. I just think it helps add a bit more personality to the game and it makes the levels feel a little bit less empty. I can also use some of their graffiti to try and show the player what to do and that should definitely make sure that everybody knows how to beat this game. There is no way that anybody could look at this and not know what to do. And after finishing all of that, I think my levels look a lot better. And I still had about an hour and a half left in the jam, which isn't that bad, until you consider the fact that I still needed a main menu, a pause menu, settings, an ending, and to actually publish the game. Plus, I had slept like 12 hours over the entire four days of the jam, so I was getting pretty tired and I wasn't really sure if I'd have the energy to finish the game on time. Courage isn't having the strength to go on, it's going on when you don't 
have the strength. So I locked in and started finishing the game while the clock ticked down. The first thing I did was set up the ending for the game. And since I didn't have that much time to make anything crazy, I just made an empty level with a tube and added some credits to show my support to the entire development team who worked really hard on this game. Then I added a pretty simple pause menu with some settings. And the last thing I did was make the game's main menu, which is just the end menu, but blue. Look, I was running out of time, okay? It was the best I could do. But at this point, I remembered that I still need to call the game something. I just wasn't really sure what name to go with. So I decided to call the game Replicate after a lot of thinking. And after all of that, I spent some time fixing some last minute bugs, which surprisingly there weren't too many of. And with only 12 minutes left, I submitted my game. Now there was an hour extension, so I technically submitted 48 minutes late, but I'm sure I would have submitted on time even without the extension. But that was just the easy part. The hard part is actually getting a high rated game and getting into the GMTK video. And you might think that there's nothing I can do, but hope I get a high enough rating to get into the top 100. But no, there is one strategy that can greatly increase the chance of getting a high rating. And that strategy is social manipulation. If I play and review a bunch of other games submitted by other people, maybe they'll decide to give me a review. And since my game is so good, it would obviously be a positive one. So I started playing and reviewing a bunch of other submissions to the game jam. And a lot of them were actually really good. What the hell is happening? Who created this? What madman came up with this idea? Oh my god. But I was still confident that my game would make it into the top 100. And after playing some more games, the reviews started pouring in. Pretty cool idea and concept. I just found the tubes really confusing and couldn't figure out what to do on the first one. Cool, it looks interesting, but I can't manage to finish the first level. I couldn't figure out how to finish a level. So the consensus seems to be positive, but nobody can figure out how to actually beat a level, which isn't good and firmly goes against the most important rule from the GMTK video of making the goal easy. I thought the bigger tube would solve that problem, but I guess when you think about it, nobody would really think to ragdoll themselves down a tube when that's also the way you reset the level. And the physics can also be a little bit difficult. I guess I just got pretty good at it throughout the development and didn't really notice. So that's it then. There was no way my game was going to make it into the GMTK video, let alone the top 100 with such a massive flaw, which really sucks because I honestly think the rest of the game is pretty good. But all I could do was wait for the GMTK video to come out so I could see for sure if I made it or not. All right. Here it is. I am a little bit late to watching this video, not because I'm afraid to watch it and see if the dozens of hours I put into this game ultimately mean nothing or anything like that. So I guess let me watch it and see. Making over 9,600 9, games. games. So I gotta get into the top 100 of those 9,600 games. I don't know how confident I feel. Even though getting into the top 100 of a game jam with 9,600 entries felt pretty much impossible, I still had a little bit of hope. But as I watched, I noticed that each of the games that made it into the video looked really good. The art style was good, the sound was good, the game design was good. And as I watched each game go by, I lost a little bit of the hope that I had left. Poop snake. Okay, That's we're halfway through. I haven't seen my game yet, but hey, maybe I'm in the top 10. Maybe I'm not in the top 20, I'm in the top 10. You never know, you know. <laughs> and then when my hopes were almost shattered in front of me, I got to the very last game of the video. No! There's still a couple minutes in the video. Maybe, maybe it's in there somewhere. So my game wasn't in the video or in the honorable mentions or as a game for background footage. I actually placed 802 for enjoyment and 986 for creativity. It's not top 100, but you know what? That's at least better than the last couple of jams. So it's an improvement, but it's, but it's not the top 100. But you know what? Out of 9,600 entries, that's actually pretty good. Especially considering that people didn't even know how to play my game. Top 10% isn't too bad. But even though I didn't make it into the video and the hours of work I put into this game meant nothing and my dreams were crushed for the third year in a row, I'm still proud of what I created. I had an idea, I worked hard, and I finished it. And even though the game had its issues, I can move on from this game jam knowing that I did my best. Which, at the end of the day, is all that really matters. I knew I should have gone with the circle idea. 